Welcome to Move to Learn. This is the Handspring webinar series for manual therapists and movement educators. And today we are delighted to welcome Heather Mason, who's the co-editor along with Kelly Birch of Yoga for Mental Health. Before our discussion, let's have a few announcements, some guidelines for how this hour will proceed. You can expect an hour of approximately 30 minutes of discussion, 15 minutes of directed practice, of breathing practice, pranayama, um, followed by uh, 15 minutes or so of questions. So during the, uh, during the webinar, the chat will be on, and you're welcome to uh, leave, of course, your comments in the chat. Just a reminder that this is being recorded, live streamed to YouTube, and also recorded, so any comments in the chat will become part of the recording. Please put your questions in the Q&A, and then um, at the 15 minutes to the hour, Heather will begin to answer your questions. Today, we will finish on the hour. Uh, some days we go after the hour. Today, we'll finish on the hour. Um, we really look forward to um, your questions and to a, a really stimulating discussion, so appropriate for these tumultuous times. As mentioned, Heather Mason is the co-editor for this groundbreaking book, Yoga for Mental Health. And I'd like to introduce Heather now with some information uh, from her bio in this book. Heather Mason is a registered yoga therapist. She has master's degrees in psychotherapy and Buddhist studies and a master of science in medical physiology. She's also done extensive academic training and lecturing in neuroscience. As a yoga therapist and a therapist in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy cognitive therapy, um, she has lectured at the Harvard's mind-body medicine class alongside global leaders in mind-body medicine research, and she continues to lecture at various universities on this topic. Heather Mason, welcome to Moved to Learn. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Lovely to be here. And in these tumultuous times, who knew that, uh, that this book and that your um, expertise would be just exactly what um, individuals and world leaders need to know. <laughs> well, yes, indeed, right now we're in a very difficult period in history for so many different reasons. And in fact, with growing levels of mental health trouble, we definitely need solutions. So, yeah. I think the book is a very good resource. Heather, would you speak about your groundbreaking work in the UK, um, helping to bring the uh, the benefits of yoga oh. for anxiety? <laughs> Look, oh, for, for first, an introduction. Oh, this is Minnie. She is my assistant. She gives me many of my ideas. Yeah. And apparently would she wanted to be on camera today. Well, <laughs> We're so grateful that, uh, that she joined you. Yes. And so um, would, you, would you speak about your relationship and how this gives you um, ideas, your relationship with your <laughs> my relationship ideas? With well, yes. I, I speak in jest, but actually in reality, my relationship with Minnie is very important. And I think during this time, um, having a pet is of great benefit if you do have one, if that's something that touches into a particular need. Because if you're isolated, as many people have been, and I know that a lot of countries have come out of lockdown, but there is still isolation, it provides you with a sense of companionship and love. And being isolated with other people can also be very challenging because human beings have personalities that encroach on each other often. And I think having the refuge of just an animal that really cares and loves you, cares about you and loves you, is a wonderful way to mitigate some of the tension and fear that's present. So I joke that she's given me ideas, but actually she teaches me constantly about love and patience, the willingness to show up continuously every day, regardless of yesterday's circumstance. 
So there is a real wisdom. I mean, other people have written about the wisdom of pets and either books that are lighthearted or, you know, research. Yeah. Yes. And um, Heather, with your background in uh, neurophysiology and neuroscience, do you have some, um, some explanations for why the relationship with the pet can be so calming? Well, I mean, there's a lot of different things. Research has shown, for example, it's funny, it's not where we expected this conversation to go, but, you know, research has shown, for example, that when you are petting an animal for about 15 minutes or more, that you increase the release of oxytocin, the bonding hormone within your bloodstream. And that is quite pleasant for the individual. It also will help with your social relationships with other human beings. And the same will happen for many. The other thing is um, for individuals often who are traumatized, when there is a sense of connection that comes forward with another human being, even if that individual wants to engage, it can feel threatening because often trauma is interpersonal and between human beings. And the safety of an animal often provides an experience of grounding that can be the foreground for modeling of other relationships. I mean, it's very common. That's why you have equine therapy and other things. And of course, there are those individuals who are traumatized by their relationship with animals. It's very person-centric. Um, but I, I'm very interested in that. And she definitely plays a star role in my life. She doesn't really know what she's doing, but she's just funny and cute and full of love. Well, I, I must say that <laughs> I feel much calmer just um, just watching you on the screen pet her. So yeah. it's it's having an effect for me. Now, for um, for those people who don't have a mini in their lives, mm -hmm. um, would you would you make a bridge into the the practice of yoga, um, mm -hmm. you know, the asana or the pranayama that can have a similar uh, or a, a related, yes, yes. Yeah. So, you know, I think the interesting thing about yoga is it does build, like if we, if we bridge right from this discussion with Minnie, it does build that sense of refuge, but inside oneself. And I think that that is so vital, of course, right now, but always, because external factors are always subject to change. But if we develop some kind of eternal or internal, but both, right, internal, eternal, equipoise through these practices, then the relationship with ourselves is nourishing. And the value of asana and pranayama is so vast. I mean, we can talk about it from the perspective of how the yoga tradition itself explores it from an energetic perspective, or we can move into the neurophysiology, which is more of how the book has looked at it. Although we did look at also the um, philosophical perspectives emergent in yoga. But when you are engaging in asana and pranayama, it gives rise to a host of psychophysiological changes that provides really a transitional space for the brain and then of course for the mind. And there are so many different reasons for why that happens, right? Mm -hmm. And it's also based upon the distinction of the practice. I mean, you're, you will have a different impact on your nervous system if you flow through a sequence and you move relatively quickly then if you hold postures, or if we go to like the extreme, or if you hold them in the way that you would in yin yoga, right? Or if you do something very rigorous, like Ashtanga yoga, or something with intense breathing, like Kundalini. But what's very interesting about yoga is regardless of which tradition you adopt and what speaks to it in that moment, all of these different traditions seem to lead to a balancing of autonomic nervous system response and neurological changes that are conducive to well-being. Now, your initial question, if it's okay if I go back to it, you wanted to know what I'm doing around anxiety and my work in the UK. So yes. that's probably anxiety and trauma are the areas that I'm that I work in the most and that I'm most familiar with the research base around, although mental health in general and extended beyond. I as many people are aware, have had 
pretty significant mental health issues in my life. And it was my decision to not go down the route of pharmacology, although it was recommended to me. And I chose instead to practice yoga and mindfulness meditation in the Buddhist style for a number of years. And that led to significant changes in my mind and the ability to cope with daily life. And although I actually had intended to become a Buddhist nun and live entirely practicing basically every waking hour, the trajectory of my life changed. And I did a master's in Buddhist studies, then one in psychotherapy. I was already a yoga teacher, and then I trained to become a yoga therapist. And I started to investigate the possibility of how yoga might, in a slightly more expedient way than mindfulness on its own, be able to pro-offer other people psychological and neurological shifts that it would empower them to take their mental health in their own hands, but also would shift the landscape, give rise to a faster neurochemical change than you have for maybe just sitting in meditation, which is highly efficacious, but I think can be very challenging from my own experience. I know that if your mind is tormenting itself. And so when I became a yoga therapist, that was my wheelhouse. And then I wanted to go deeper. So I studied neuroscience, right? And, and continued along that vein and moving from one thing to the another, opening up the Minded Institute, which trains yoga therapists, um, not just to work with mental health, but with all conditions that yoga is presumed to be beneficial for. And then finally moving into trying to bring yoga into healthcare, which is something that I do, and also working with parliament. And first and foremost, I am speaking about the mental health piece, not only because that's what I know best, Elizabeth, but also because the mental health pandemic is so rife and was so rife even before COVID. And I'm especially interested and yoga's value now that COVID has hit. And I perceive the mental health consequences of COVID to be what I would call the second wave of the pandemic. Yeah, and I've been doing yeah. quite a lot of reading in preparation for this as to surveys that are emerging, showing um, what is happening across the globe and it is quite disturbing. Um, but I wonder if, before I get into any of that, and I know I'm now in a little bit of a soliloquy and I'm sorry, if it might be useful if I express in what ways yoga is uniquely beneficial for anxiety. That would be wonderful. That was one of my questions of curiosity. Please okay. <laughs> carry on. <laughs> okay. So, um, of course, there are other treatments for anxiety. And in much of the developed world, Cognitive be um, behavioral therapy is the most common form of treatment, right? And that involves looking at one's own mental processes and behaviors and then trying to substitute behaviors and thoughts that are not useful with those that would be more useful for the individual. But I think, you know, there's, there is a certain level of limitation to that therapy, although it shows up pretty well in clinical trials. And yoga is very attractive because it has some of those aspects and it adds in more. So yoga traditionally has eight limbs, right? And the first limb is the yamas, which are essentially ways of perceiving reality. So we can actually look at that as like the cognitive aspect of cognitive behavioral therapy, right? So there are principles of how to look at one's life non-harming, contentment, and so on and so forth, being mindful about one's use of sexuality and coming from a perspective that is going to be useful for that being and for the world. And then we have the niyamas and the niyamas are behaviors or often we call them observances, but really they're ways of behaving that are conducive to our well-being. So we have that aspect. And then we move to the part that is most popular, I guess in the West, which is the asana, right? The postures. And we already know the value of exercise in many mental health conditions. In fact, for example, in like depression, 
it often will show up better than medication, which is very interesting. If we're talking about like mild to moderate depression, right? Mm -hmm. Anxiety also beneficial, but depression specifically stands out. And so although asana is much more than exercise, it also is exercise, right? So we can look at it from that perspective. Then we have pranayama, breath practice, and the power of breathing to shift autonomic response, something that is so highly imbalanced in anxiety, where we have a high level of sympathetic drive, low level of parasympathetic activity, and an inability to flex between these two systems effectively. Um, a breathing practice that can bring balance back to the autonomic system, allowing for greater flexibility between that rest and digest parasympathetic aspect of the nervous system. And then the mobilization of energy when necessary is really important in anxiety and all mental health conditions. Then we go to pratyara, which is really reduction of sensory input, but we can consider it taking a little bit of license mindfulness and we have a good collection of research growing showing that mindfulness is effective with mental health conditions then we move into the meditative aspects of yoga which are harder to mark along modern psychological approaches and express how that works but meditation is also something that is investigated by researchers for psychological interventions right and then finally, we have the last piece of the limbs, which is samadhi, connection to oneness with everything. And if we take a little bit of a license, we can consider how yoga allows us to feel connected also to other members of the community, feeling less socially isolated, a very common component of mental health conditions and certainly present very much during COVID. And so returning to that sense of feeling community also helps to usurp that feeling of loneliness. And so yoga offers all that value. And this can also be seen from a, a biochemical perspective in that we know that yoga can increase levels of the major inhibitory neurotransmitter, GABA. Dr. Chris Streeter has done some really good quality, rigorous research on that. And GABA is low in anxiety and in many mental health disorders that it increases brain derived neurotrophic factor, the fertilizer of neuroplasticity, that it reduces cortisol, a stress related hormone, that it is associated with increased levels of prefrontal cortical volume usually meaning that we have more flexible um, minds and reduced volume year on year of the amygdala, the fear-based network, you know, and I could go on and on because I love the research and I'm a bit of a nerd. <laughs> yes, um, but yeah. Heather, may, may, I, may I just ask, yeah. um, um, I'm curious about in this research and also the research you were mm -hmm. citing and also in your experience, um, mm -hmm. your own experience and your experience in teaching others, what, what comments do you have to make about the dosage, about the frequency and the duration of practice? Because you mentioned that uh, your life course at one point was to become a Buddhist nun, uh, mm -hmm. practicing 24 hours a day. <laughs> so how, what kind of recommendations do you have regarding dosage now? Mm. Okay, so it's a great question. And, you know, I have my own ideas about it. And then there's the emerging research base around this. So generally in mental health conditions, more is better. Like we continue to find that. But exactly what is that like sweet spot? That's difficult, right? It's easier to find with medications where you say, okay, exactly this much. And you have something like in pharmacology called a dose response curve. But what we do seem to find is that twice a week is significantly more effective than once a week. So the minimum amount of time that somebody with a mental health issue should be considering practicing is twice a week. And it seems that 30 to 45 minutes is also the minimum amount of practice time, but it does depend on what you're doing. Although some people might debate this, it seems that the breathing practices are the most effective. And so if you were doing that for like 20 minutes, that would probably be as good, I say probably, grain of salt here, um, as good as doing like 45 minutes of asana. Combining them is going to be probably more effective as well. So minimum twice a week, 30 minutes a day. And if you really want to see change, you should be practicing at least five days a week for 
half an hour to 45 minutes minimum. And we was see that that, that, was that your choice. What, 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 was, oh. that, was that your choice um, when, when you decided to go the non non pharmacological mm -hmm. route? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, was that your practice of, of five times a week, 45 minutes? Or how did you manage? No, it? I mean, my I, I wouldn't expect people to do what I did. In fact, that's one of the reasons that I moved into yoga and out of just mindfulness meditation practice as the thing that I teach, because I was practicing every waking hour. That was actually what was required in the monastery. So we'd wake up at four or five, depending on the monastery. You would start your practice. Then you had breakfast for 45 minutes, but you had to practice through breakfast. Then you had shower time. Then you practiced. Then you had lunch. Then you practiced. And you continue to do that until about 10 o'clock at night on four to, no, five to six hours of sleep and every waking hour you're practicing. So it's not realistic for people living any normal life you have to live in a completely monastic situation excuse me but five to six hours of sleep doesn't really hold up for research these days either <laughs> i think that i i agree but i think that if you're living in an extraordinary condition that you have to consider that because your mind is constantly in a state of meditation and that may change the goalpost around what would be normal for somebody living uh you know as we would say, a lay person's life. That's the life of a, like a mystic. And the purpose of that was not mental transformation. It was enlightenment. So if that's your goal, you're going to live a different life than um, the average person. Yes. Yes. Now, a few paragraphs back, I interrupted yeah. you. <laughs> you <laughs> held up your hand, but I kept going. So please. what was I saying? I don't remember. Oh, I was just going to say, oh yeah, I remember. I was just going to say, we are finding in research that practicing like once a week for many years is less effective than practicing many days a week for six months. So that's something to note. Yes. And for the person who is beginning their practice, mm -hmm. um, what, what do you recommend as an, an entry into their, their twice a week practice? Would it be the pranayama first? I mean, I really like to have individual attention to have time to work with somebody and understand what their needs are but i think that the value of pranayama might be higher than asana because you can bring it into every aspect of your life so if you learn a simple pranayama that has the ability to calm you down or to lift your mood potentially you could do that in a business meeting um, in bed with your partner when you feel stressed and so the off the mat value is higher and so the, the most simple thing that I suggest with the greatest benefit is the elongation of the exhalation using your jaya breath. It's very powerful, it's very simple, and it's powerful enough that it's still a prime part of my practice. And I've been practicing yoga for 24 years. Regarding the um, increasing the duration of the exhalation during the ujjayi breath, Mm -hmm. um, would you would you speak about the physiological changes that does with respect to carbon dioxide or um... carbon dioxide? Well, that's interesting. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's that's really not one of the primary benefits of elongating the exhalation. That's more relevant to breath holds, which I can speak about mm -hmm. if you like. But mm -hmm. do you want to know the value of the elongation of the exhalation before I move to breath holds? Please. Okay. Yes. So when you elongate the exhalation, it has an impact on your vagus nerve, which downgrades the rate of the heart and has a knock-on effect. So let me explain. So your vagus nerve is the major nerve of the parasympathetic system, that rest and digest system. It courses out of the brainstem, the medulla oblongata, and it has two branches. Now, most of actually, interestingly, most of the fibers of this nerve go from the body up to the brain. And so the impact of breathing and moving on brain functioning is significant in relationship to parasympathetic response. But intriguingly, one of its most important downward-based pathways, or we call efferent pathways, is from brain to heart. And during an exhalation, the vagus increases its messaging to the heart. Now, the messaging is neurotransmission. It releases a chemical called acetylcholine to the sinoatrial node of the heart.
And every time it does, it reduces the rate and intensity of contraction. So when you elongate your exhalation in relationship to your inhalation, you slow down the rate of your heart. The impact of that is then picked up by other nerves, including the vagus sent back up to the brain, indicating that we are safe and evoking more parasympathetic response. And if, as we continue this, it's a reciprocal downward upward pathway that's constantly occurring, leading to very quick psychophysiological changes. If you want me to speak about the carbon dioxide piece, I can. Um, uh, only if that's relevant to the today's practice and the trajectory of why, why we would appreciate the value of yoga during these times. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there is a real value in that. I see breath holds where the carbon dioxide aspect becomes really valuable as a little bit more advanced because for many people with anxiety, holding the breath can cause more fear. But you see, as, you're, as you noted, um, there are changes in gas levels with changing the breath. Because carbon dioxide is always being created by the body through the process of the synthesizing of ATP or energy molecule, and carbon dioxide is one of the byproducts. When you hold your breath, we're not inhaling more right, and you're not letting out more carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide levels increase. Now, our brain is primed to speed up the rate of breathing when carbon dioxide levels increase because carbon dioxide makes the blood slightly more acidic, which we want to avoid. But holding the breath will not make the blood acidic enough that it is in any um, risk of danger. But what happens is in order to get out that extra carbon dioxide, through a process of sensing chemo differences or chemical differences, we speed up the breathing. If, however, you hold your breath and learn to tolerate slightly larger amount of carbon dioxide, slightly more within the bloodstream, it seems that that mechanism that is turned on to speed up the rate of the exhalation, which is sympathetically mediated, doesn't get turned on as easily or we're less reactionary. And the end product of that is that we are um, a little bit more resilient, a little bit. So breath holds can help with psychological resilience. Thank you for that clarity. You're um, welcome. What, which direction would you like to go now? A, a, directed, <laughs> pr a directed practice, um, speaking about your work in parliament? Well, right now, my here. work on Parliament is very much on hold. I mean, since Parliament isn't really meeting properly, uh, I'm I'm extremely interested. Though, actually, maybe I'll read you something if if you're open to that. I was looking today um, at what government guidance is going to be in terms of mental health as a result of the pandemic. And this came out of the Center for Mental Health in the UK recommending guidance to Public Health England and the government at large. It says the government of Public Health England should provide advice and support to organizations, including schools, health and care services and businesses in trauma informed approaches to help them create a sense of psychological safety for people who use in work. I don't know what that means for people who use them in work. I think that's what they mean to say and in following the lockdown. So there's already a recognition of how trauma responses are going to increase and recommendation for trauma informed approaches. And so when I have an opportunity to speak to parliamentarians again, I'm going to address the fact that trauma has shown up quite, um, sorry, yoga has shown up quite beneficial for trauma and especially like across many of the different whether it's complex trauma or developmental trauma across different diagnostics and that this is a inexpensive intervention that should be considered as the government is attempting to manage the huge mental health crisis so that's the direction i'll be going in but yeah i haven't been in touch recently because of well parliament has more serious things to think about at the moment, given the state of the world. Yes, um, I apologize that my previous question um, was not clear because I didn't yeah. 
I didn't frame what I meant by now (laughs) Um, at at the present moment, which is um, 30 minutes after the hour or now in the big picture, (laughs) but, but, uh, but at, sorry, but at 30 minutes after the hour, um, may we have soon um, a, uh, a directed breathing practice. uh, Sure. Sure. You. Yeah. So why don't we do the elongated exhalation? Ah. Um, Uh, with Ujjayi breath, because it is so powerful. And the method that I'm going to teach is also something that's so simplistic that people even just learning it today can take it out to other individuals. So why don't people get settled? I know that this is an awkward thing to say in the middle of the lecture, but I have to run to the loo. (laughs) I'll be back in 30 seconds, but I can't get through another half an hour. (laughs) Otherwise. Good. Okay. I in meantime, um, I will read more of your bio, which okay. um, I Great. think I'll be right I back. think people would like to hear. Let's just see. I need to get to uh, to that particular page. Right. So, a little um directed reading story time. Um, let's see. Um. Previously, Heather lectured on the neurobiology of post-traumatic stress disorder and on the neurological mechanisms of yoga and mindfulness as relevant interventions at the world-renowned Boston Trauma Center. In 2008, she developed a program for patients with post-traumatic stress, post-traumatic stress disorder um, at the Maudsley Hospital in London one of the UK's leading psychiatric hospitals. As part of her mission to incorporate yoga into society, Heather co-organized national yoga therapy conferences in the UK. She is also a yoga researcher and her main area of interest is how pranayama affects the central nervous system, which is just a setting us up for um, what we're excited to experience Perfect timing, Heather. We're Wonderful. Back. And okay. I should just add to that that I've just applied for a degree in respiratory medicine because I'm so in love with the breath um, so that I can wow. hopefully add more value. Where Where is that degree housed? Uh, it's going to be online because oh. um, it's, it's run by the University of South Wales in the UK, but everything's oh. online at the moment. So, yes. yeah. Okay, so this very simple practice has significant value. And I I think it's so important to understand that as well, that sometimes it's the very easy things in yoga that can actually deliver the best results. We don't need to do complicated postures, put our legs behind our head or, you know, hold our breath for minutes at a time, that we can do very simple things that are safe for almost everybody and it will confer great benefit. So Ujjayi breathing, if you're not familiar with it, some of you might be, sounds like this, okay? So I'm gonna get a little bit closer to the computer. You'll probably see like my nose towards the screen. So it sounds like this. Although technically in English, it translates to Victoria's breath, a lot of people call it ocean breathing because they say that the the practice sounds like the ocean. Now in yoga classes, often what we do is we inhale Ujjayi and exhale Ujjayi. And that can offer great value, especially if individuals are already familiar with the practice. But we have found that for individuals that are completely new, there is a tendency to pull in the Ujjayi inhalation, which undermines the parasympathetic effect. So that if anybody is new to the practice, they're better off just doing the exhalation for about a week or two, strengthening the muscles that are used in the throat for this, and then more organically, they can do the inhalation without pulling in the breath. So you will decide on whether you do it with the inhale or exhale based on whether or not you practice it regularly. Now, if you are familiar with it, you can begin while I give instructions to the newbies. If you're new, All right, you might think, how am I going to make that weird noise through my nose? Don't worry, because we've all made a similar noise actually through our mouths when we fogged up a mirror. So I want you to pick up this theoretical mirror 
and look at your gorgeous faces, right? And don't doubt your beauty. Inhale naturally through the nose. We're gonna exhale nice and long through the mouth. Lovely, let's do that again. Inhale naturally. One more time. Lovely. Now, let's not think of it coming out of the nose because that complicates things if we're new. Let's imagine, although it's a bit strange, that the nose is actually at the center of the throat. And if it feels okay, you can place your index and middle finger there so you have some contact. And you're gonna inhale naturally into the throat and then exhale out of the throat, but actually close the mouth so it's coming out of the nose. And again. One more time. Lovely. Now you can keep your finger here if you'd like, or your fingers. If you feel comfortable with this breath, you can place them on your knees or in your lap, wherever you'd like to place your hands. And what we're going to do is a one to ratio. So I'm going to count everybody in five times, inhaling one, two, and exhaling one, two, three, four. Now, after I do it four, uh, five times, you can choose to extend it if that feels okay for you to three, six, or four, eight, okay? But it's so important, and I can't emphasize this enough, that you are not pulling in the breath to make the inhale longer or pushing out the breath to make the exhale longer. When you do that, because you have a lot of sensory receptors in your lungs, you tax the lungs indicating to the brain actually you're stressed. So you will undermine any of the positive effects that we're trying to develop here. So beginning now with your eyes downcast or closed as you see fit. And maybe even the people that are used to practicing to come out of automatic pilot, just inhaling naturally. One, two. Exhaling the jai. One, two, three, four. Inhale. One, two. Exhale. One, two, three, four. Inhale, one, two. Exhale, one, two, three, four. Inhale, one, two. Exhale, one, two, three, four. Inhale, one, two. Exhale, one, two, three, four. Continue with the Ujjayi exhalation. And if you feel you would prefer to move to three, six, or four, eight, go ahead. If two, four seems right for you, then continue. And we'll just do this for the next five minutes. I'll practice with you. If the mind goes out, as it often does, just bring it back to the breath. Help to remind the mind. That just now, it's only breath that it needs to focus on. Nothing else. Just breath. Allowing breath to work its magic. And the mind to not have the power to engage in its busyness and all of its stories for just a second. For just a limited period of time. To give all the tension over to the power of breath.
keep going. If your mind tells you you have something else to do, just let those thoughts be there. Believe in the power of your breath. Have faith and just resume. Come back to just this. It's so simple, so potent. Let go of the need for things to be exciting or complex in exchange for the possibility that something basic offers you great transformation. And take just two more ujjayi breaths, the exhale elongated, and then just notice at the end how you feel. No expectation, just an honest awareness. In fact, doing pranayama sets us up so nicely to do mindfulness to just observe with equanimity the nature of ourselves. To return to a place of curiosity away from the busyness or fear that often pervades the mind. Just notice who you are in this moment, your energy, any thoughts, and if they have a theme, the speed of them, areas of openness and contraction in the body, and equal measures. And feel the natural breath as it ebbs and flows through your nostrils. And when you're ready, and there is no rush, allow yourself to flutter your eyes open. If you feel that you want to continue with this practice with my voice in the background, as well as the questions, that's absolutely fine as well. So Elizabeth, I know that we are at the next portion, which is Q&A. There was only one question that I saw so far, and I'm very interested. Michael Hall asked this question as to Michael Hall, if you're still on what your background is in answering this, in asking this question, because you've asked if wearing a mask prevents the exchange of nitric oxide that's going to leave the nervous system in fight and flight. Um, First of all, nitric oxide is not the only mediator of parasympathetic response. It's a question that I've heard also discussed with respiratory experts. Possibly there is some effect. I wouldn't want to state how grand that effect would be. But of course, I think that wearing a mask in terms of our physical safety would supersede the need to let go of wearing a mask in hopes that somehow we would get more nitric oxide into our system. Also to just note that nitric oxide is produced internally within our system. So there is the possibility that we can uh, release more of it. And so it's not all about what is occurring externally to the body. I think that there is a lot of perception around mask and what that might mean. And I'm not sure from a health perspective, that that aligns with any kind of dangerous. And also there are loads of masks. Uh, oh, you teach Qigong and yoga, thank you. There are lots of masks that if they're more expensive, allow for more free flow of air in and out. I just bought one the other day, I don't know what it's called. So 
I wouldn't concern myself with that. I do think though, it is uncomfortable to practice yoga with a mask on. I mean, I'll be honest. So I think we need to find other solutions if we're gonna be in, in classes together, but I definitely am pro mask. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yes, Heather, I have one. Okay. Which is, um, following the, um, the Ujjayi breathing practice, Mm -hmm. um, what recommend what recommendations do you have for following that if one's going to follow with asana practice? So I think it, it depends. You know, if you're feeling incredibly anxious, you might just want to do calming asana with the elongated exhalation at the same time. That can be of benefit. Um, but if you are working to strengthen your resiliency, and you can do that even if you're regularly presenting with anxiety. What I would recommend is taking some asanas where it's slightly challenging to breathe, whether it's moving through sun salutations more quickly and doing it more intense ones where you're still elongating the exhalation or taking some back bends working on that because that allows the nervous system to kind of up the ante in terms of having quite a lot of sympathetic drive. And at the same time, all of this parasympathetic energy is coming in. And so it allows a bit of a reset. And so for my own practice, for example, if I am feeling anxious, I would probably do a calming practice with elongated exhalation. And if I'm feeling like I wanna strengthen my system, I would do something a little bit more lifting, but still with a calming breath. Thank you. And My now another 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 flurry of questions oh, okay. from from Liz Oakley. She says, "Oh, I know Hi, Liz Heather. Oakley. Hi, Liz. Oh, good. <laughs> With the extended With breath, which I love. When would you introduce Ujjayi in the ex the inhale? Um, no, not only with advanced students. So generally, if I am satisfied that." the individual has been practicing throughout the week and is not struggling, I would introduce it after one week. I don't require a lot of time, right? So you have the work of the laryngeal muscles, which we don't talk about when teaching because it will confuse students, but they're becoming slightly more toned and the inhalation then becomes easier and more fluid. So I add it often in the second week. If a student is struggling with Ujjayi breath, probably not. Moving forward, do you think a post-COVID yoga rehab program may be a good thing to initiate? Yeah, I do. Um, and I think we'll find that as well with social prescribing. So social prescribing is something, Elizabeth, we have in the United Kingdom. I don't think you have it in the United States, although it's discussed in the United States. It's essentially the appreciation that activity groups or something that can mitigate the effect of social isolation. So you can actually be prescribed or referred into an activity group of your interest by your physician. And so yoga is one of the social prescribing offerings. And since it's all about social connectedness and we're dealing with an epidemic right now of social isolation worse than we had before, I think that yoga for social prescribing in the UK, specifically as part of the COVID um, amelioration period is going to be very important. And that's something that I'm looking at, the role of that together. In the United States and other countries where social prescribing may not be on the agenda, still offering yoga classes from that perspective and hopefully courses so that you have a consistent group of people together that go forward from that place of fear and anxiety and isolation into connection and community. Any yes. thoughts on yoga? Um, oh, sorry. I'm just... Um, Heather. <laughs> Heather, we, we, we do have um, some aspect of uh, social prescribing in oh, the you US. Do? In, oh, you do? Well, okay. in, the, in that physicians will recommend to, uh, to parents of young children that mm -hmm. they specifically spend time in green spaces, that they get outdoors together to make sure that the child has, um, is, is in greenery and the families in greenery as well. So that could be considered perhaps a, a, a precursor to what you're describing as social yeah. prescribing. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Oh, it's good to know that that's happening. That's, that's really great. Um, any thoughts on yoga and men's mental health? I mean, so many. <laughs> I think that yoga is a very interesting place for men with mental health issues to arrive at. Still, we have this preponderance of women showing up to yoga classes, but we have um, 
both an underreporting of men with mental health issues and a reduction of men showing up to services often because they wanna manage it themselves or this sense of shame. And I think if it's not an acute mental health issue, yoga can be billed as a way to manage stress because many people prefer that language and men can show up without speaking about having a mental health issue and work their mental health through yoga and come to a class around stress, around stress and really benefit. But I think it is very important that men drive that because it is because there are so many females in yoga and not men that I think that it continues to have that perception of um, being a practice more for women, even though originally it was the reverse. Um, should I keep answering? Because, um, oh, Elizabeth, please. Because yes, there, there's time, oh, certainly. Okay. Yeah. What role does increasing awareness of proprioception of the body play? Um, so Keith, hi Keith, I know Keith as well. I mean, it plays presumably an enormous value if you have a lack of proprioception. I mean, that's always, so, so for people that don't know that word, proprioception refers to the awareness of the body in space. And that is often compromised in trauma and other more acute mental health issues. Um, you may see that in anxiety. And so when you gain a greater understanding of where your body is in space, generally you feel more embodied and that is associated with a shift in how you experience also your emotions. So I think it is important. I would probably say interception awareness of, the of sensations in the body would be more of an important piece there, but yeah, proprioception would play a role as well. I am newly qualified, I'm a newly qualified yoga teacher and I have a huge passion for yoga and mental health. I would love to learn more and be able to share this with others. Can you share with me how to start to learn more around this subject? So the book is actually a great resource that Kelly and I put together, Yoga and Mental Health. Um, the Minded Institute of which I'm the founder offers a lot of short courses. And in fact, next week we have one yeah, uh, mental health skills for yoga teachers, which is a really good place to start even as a newbie. Um, and you can engage in other short courses. And when you find Louise, the area that you're most passionate about, you can continue to follow the teachers that you feel are providing you with the information that speaks most to your heart. And then eventually you'll find your own methods and ways. Heather, in the previous question, um, you yeah. mentioned that that interoception, paying attention mm -hmm. to the interoceptive messages was as significant as proprioception, if not more so. Would mm -hmm. you um, amplify that? I mean, that's just my feeling. It's, you know, proprioception is related to interoception, where the body is in space. But I think that actually sensing into what the body is feeling is so important in mental health issues because what often happens is there's a disconnect and one is not really aware of what is happening in the body or as happens in some other mental health conditions, there's this hyper awareness of the body and fear around sensation. And so I think finding the body as a place of interest and intrigue that provides data and information that is useful to make sense of our needs in the moment is vital in better self-care and better self-care leads to better mental health. And if we go further down the discussion, right, having missed a bunch of steps, there is evidence to suggest that as we continue to become more aware of bodily sensations, we move from a place of processing emotions from a cognitive place. And when we do that and we start like we worry about something and we keep worrying and worrying and worrying, there is a eternal almost proliferation of that worry. And if we move to, okay, what does it feel like that I'm having this experience right now in our body? It tends to cut that mental process from happening. Also, we can see that neurologically. And people who engage in interoceptive practices organically without effort seem to move from cognitive processing to more interoceptive processing, which leads to greater emotional well-being and health. And there's some really great work that's done um, from Bud Craig and um, Norman, why can't, I keep wanting to say Norman Dodge, but it's not Norman Dodge. Um, why can't I think of his name? But it'll come back to me on interoception 
and um, mind-body practices and their value for mental health. Yes. Yeah. Just to note that there have been um, part of the Fascia Research Society yes. webinar series has offered a, a couple of lectures um, within the past month to six weeks on the topic, the, 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 the more specific science that you're alluding to with interoception. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh, lovely. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's very important. Oh, more Norman Farr, that's who it is. I just had to look it up. Um, I think it's very important. And looking at the relationship between fascia intro and proprioception is very exciting stuff. Yeah. Yes. Heather, we um, know there's that one more, it's, it's, oh, another question, one more question, and then it's time for you to go. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Interesting. Are we looking at things as more of an embodiment practice, too? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think that you can really talk about yoga without honestly speaking of embodiment. I actually find it like... Um, sometimes superfluous to say embodiment yoga, because what else would yoga be? You know, you are coming into your being. And even though yoga has this tinge of possibly being beyond the body, it isn't. It's the connection of the body and mind and that fusion that leads to the transformation of self. So absolutely. I think that that's essential, Angela. Handspring has prepared a slide um, regarding okay. your book on how people oh. can order your book. Oh, okay. But before, before we have that, do you have uh, closing remarks, summary remarks? I would just say that for those of you on this session who are struggling with your mental well-being, to trust in the potential that yoga can offer you something. And for those of you here that are teaching others, to really kind of take up the baton and move forward with it. Because I don't think that we have ever had such a mental health crisis as the one we're about to see because the population is so immense, you know? So um, our services are needed. We truly, truly needed more now more than ever. Good. Heather, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Be well. You too. Yeah. Namaste. Mm -hmm. And I should probably go because while well, I have another meeting. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, in the while while you're transitioning, we'll be looking at the, the slide about your book. Great. So the book that Heather has co-edited with Kelly Birch. Oh, I need that slide again. Yes, is uh, Yoga for Mental Health. And Handspring Publishing is offering 25% off this book and you have the information for ordering it on your slide. Our next event with Move to Learn is on Wednesday, July 22nd, and it's featuring Jan Tawartha, who has written and co-edited co a book on, um, I was gonna say Yoga for Scars. No, that's today, Yoga for Mental Health, but a, a groundbreaking book about uh, scars and manual therapy. So we look forward to you joining us on Wednesday, July 22nd. Thank you, everybody. Be well, and we'll see you next time at Move to Learn. Bye.